in the last video, I told you all about the book that I'm going to be reading you by Macmillan Children's Books. And it's called How to Be a Hero, Take Up the Quest by Kat Weldon. And I've just been having a look through this book and there are so many pictures of things that we have learned about in school. So if you are in my class at school, look, you can see there's a map there of Midgard, the home of the humans. And when we learned all about Vikings last term, you learned all about that. So I'm hoping you'll enjoy this book as much as me. So let's get going. This is chapter one, The Cup of Crud. Tonight we feast, tomorrow we fight. The enormous man, big enough to be two normal men, but average sized for one Viking, raised his drinking horn high into the air. Ales slopped out of it and rained down on those sitting around the rough wooden table. Another man raised his hand. Uh, um, who are we fighting? Because we're not technically at war with anybody right now. The enormous man paused, his red face screwed up in thought. How about tonight we feast, tomorrow we go on a nice picnic? The other Viking continued, mopping ale off his head with his sleeve. Ugh, I like picnics. No, it's supposed to rain tomorrow, replied one, with tufty hair tied back in pigtails. What about tonight we feast, tomorrow we pick our toenails? Or tonight we feast, tomorrow we press flowers? Ha, huh. after eating Ethel's cooking, it should be tonight we feast, tomorrow we have toxic turnip breath croaked a voice from the back several people grumbled in agreement and then ducked as ethel threw a ladle across the room a viking with a dark bushy beard climbed ponderously to his feet and silenced the room with a loud burp tonight we feast tomorrow we have an ultimate shin kicking contest this suggestion received an enormous cheer the air filled with ale foam and half chewed up food as cups and plates were tossed towards the rafters. Unnoticed by anyone, a pale, scruffy boy put down the tray he carried and ducked out of the door. The boy's name was Whetstone. It wasn't a very good name and he didn't like it much, but it was all he had. Outside, the cool air tickled his white skin, making the hairs on his arms rise. Whetstone pulled his thin cloak around his shoulders and stepped away from the door. Cutting through the wispy clouds above him hung a bright yellow moon, giving him just enough light to see by. Behind him, in the great hall of crud, the Vikings were still cheering. Whetstone had only been in the village for a couple of days, having managed to blag a job in the kitchens. It hadn't been hard. There wasn't exactly a cue to help clean up after Viking feasts and trying to get these grease stains off the ceiling was a nightmare. All Vikings were the same, finding any excuse to guzzle and gorge all night until their already pink blotchy faces grew pinker and blotchier and they fell asleep under the table. Whetstone gazed up at the moon and grinned. They wouldn't be celebrating when they found out what his real plans were. A deathly white hand dropped onto Whetstone's shoulder and his heart jumped into his mouth as he spun around. Oh, Valley, it's you, he sagged with relief. The taller boy nodded at him. Come on, you know he doesn't like to be kept waiting. He released Whetstone and headed away from the Great Hall, finding his way easily in the darkness. I couldn't get out earlier, Whetstone skipped after him. I'm supposed to be working at the feast. I saw the cup, though. Valley grabbed hold of Whetstone's tunic. In his free hand, a knife gleamed. I know Lightfinger thinks you're the one who's going to take it, but remember, I was here first. He gave Whetstone a little shake. You're a nobody. We felt sorry for you, that was all. The boy released Whetstone's tunic. Once you have the cup, you give it to me, understand? Whetstone brushed himself off, 
It was impossible to imagine that Valley, this boy with dark, sunken eyes and almost translucent skin, had been the one to convince him to leave home and join the thieves. It seemed unimaginable that he had been nice once. With a final look behind him, Valley led the way out of the village and moved towards a nearby thicket of trees. A flickering light appeared. It was the thieves' camp. Whetstone followed Valley towards the firelight, tripping as his two large boots caught in unseen rabbit holes and clumps of rough grass. They stepped into the circle of light, a shabby-looking man with an overly large front teeth, glanced up. The long wooden staff he used to support a damaged leg lay by his side. Did you see it on the shelf next to the fireplace? Chief, Chief Awful Rick always likes to display his treasures during feasts. The man spat into the fire which spluttered green for a moment. Whetstone nodded slowly, thinking of the golden cup studded with jewels that he had seen whilst collecting plates. Lightfinger, are you sure it has to be me that steals it? I'm doing this as a favour to you, Whetstone. Don't you want fortune and glory? The ratty-looking man probed. Or would you rather scrub porridge out of pans for the rest of your life? Valley dropped onto a nearby tree stump and sniggered. Yeah, you might as well get used to thieving. It's not as though you're going to turn out to be a hero, are you? Watch out, Valley. If you carry on like that, Whetstone will think you don't like him. Valley gave Whetstone a pained smile, the blade still in his hand, twisting easily through his fingers. Whetstone shifted awkwardly, his eyes fixed on the knife. It's not the boy's fault you failed to get the cup, Lightfinger snarled. He turned back to Whetstone. You're not going to fail me, are you, Whetstone? I know this is your first big theft and it's natural to feel nervous, but you'll soon get used to it. He hasn't got the guts for it, Valley scoffed, picking at his nails with the dagger. Let me have another try. It's only a cup, after all. No, Lightfinger snapped. You had your chance. This is Whetstone's job now. It's taken me years to track down that cup and I'm not leaving crud without it. Valley stabbed the knife into the tree stump and leaned back on his arms, his expression hidden in shadows. It's only a shame I can't take it myself. Alas, I am too recognisable, too well known, too slow. Valley dodged a blow from Lightfinger's staff. Whetstone dug his nails into his palms. If I take it, you're sure I'll be famous? The man nodded. More than your wildest dreams. Whetstone sighed. He had some pretty wild dreams. In his heart, he knew that he didn't have the skills to be a great warrior. He could hardly lift a sword and he preferred running away to fighting. He would never make it as an explorer due to chronic seasickness, but a thief. That was a possibility. He was quick and sneaky and nobody seemed to notice him much. When Valley and Lightfinger, the greatest thief in all the known world, had arrived in his village and Valley suggested Whetstone join them, it had seemed too good an opportunity to miss. People loved telling stories of Lightfinger's exploits. If Whetstone could steal great treasures just like Lightfinger, then people would know his name and sing stories about his fantastic adventures too. Then he would be somebody. And being somebody, even being a thief, was better than being a nobody. All he had to do was steal Awful Rick's stupid cup and then he could be part of the thieves' gang for good. Mind you, the life of a celebrity isn't everything it's cracked up to be, Lightfinger sighed. All the autographs, signing and people trying to kiss you. You're just a kid, you don't want to be worried about that. Whetstone felt his cheeks burn. You'll never get a minute's rest. Everywhere you go, it will be Whetstone. Tell us about the time you... Well, never mind that. You haven't actually done anything yet, have you? The boy bit his lip. The thought of returning home to the village of Trot as Whetstone the Sly or Whetstone the Cunning, anything instead of Whetstone the Nothing, made his head buzz. But at the time, he felt bad about stealing from Awful Rick and the Vikings of Crud. They had been quite kind to him, really. He hadn't even had too many chicken bones thrown at him during the feast. Lightfinger seemed to sense Whetstone's doubts. Using his staff 
to lever himself upright, the crooked man got to his feet. He loomed over Whetstone, who was treated to a lovely view right up his nose. A large, knobbly bogey hung there, glinting in the moonlight. He wrapped his arm around Whetstone's shoulder. I've been keeping an eye on you, Whetstone. Whenever I dropped into drot over the years, Lightfinger smiled, I knew you were going to be very useful to me one day. Valley tossed something into the fire behind them. The flames fizzled. Whetstone remembered his life in the cold, grey village of Drott and shuddered. He had lived there with his foster mother, Angraboda, or the Angry Bogey, as he secretly called her, in the rescue home for orphaned wolf cubs, done howling. She had taken him in after he turned up suddenly in the middle of the village in a basket. No one really knew where he came from. I still think it's a mistake, Valley said from the shadows. The runt will only mess it up. Lightfinger snarled, his ratty teeth casting odd shadows on his face. Be quiet, you. He turned back to Whetstone. Valley doesn't understand. He's not like us. The cup is the key. Lightfinger often said that. The key to what? The key to you joining us, of course, he said quickly. Don't you want a place to belong? He gave Whetstone's shoulder another squeeze. Remember what I told you, the cup is magical. It can tell us many things, things that will make us famous. Us? You, of course. The saga of Whetstone and the magic cup, I can hear it already. Whetstone narrowed his eyes. Lightfinger was desperate to get his hands on Awful Rick's cup. It was all he talked about. He claimed it could tell fortunes. I still don't understand why you picked me to do this. Call it my master thief instincts. That cup will unlock an amazing future for you. But you have to hold it in your hands. I don't just take anyone on as my apprentice, you know. After all, I am the greatest thief in all the known world, Whetstone recited. Lightfinger squeezed his shoulder again, the grip painfully tight. I know, I know, the boy muttered. I have taken the jewelled crown of Queen Helga the Iron Fists, Lightfinger continued, his eyes bright with past victories, plundered the famed pearl of the Mer people, and, and picked the pockets of kings, queens and princes, Whetstone finished. He liked hearing these stories almost as much as Lightfinger liked telling them. My thefts are a way of adding a little spice to the boring run of days. What is life without a twist or a turn along the way? Whetstone's fingers wound the edge of his cloak into knots. Don't you ever worry about getting caught? Vikings were not kind to thieves. If awful Rick caught him, Whetstone would probably be marooned on the barren islands to be eaten by the wild beasts who lived there. Or... Maybe Awful Rick would force-feed him mouldy toenails until he choked. Or worst of all, perhaps Whetstone would have to hand-wash the skid marks out of all the Viking underpants in the village. Ugh. Fame and fortune were all very well, but you had to be alive to enjoy them. Lightfinger released the boy's shoulder and moved away. Maybe Valley's right. Maybe you're not brave enough. He scratched his stubbly chin with the top of his staff. The silvery snakes that decorated it sparkled in the moonlight. I suppose I'll just have to take you back to Drott. No way! I'm not going back, Whetstone said stoutly. If the price of leaving the angry bogey was taking Awful Rick's cup, well, Awful Rick would just have to go and get another one. I'll get the cup. And the glory too. Excellent! Lightfinger clapped him on the shoulder. His mouth curved into a cold smile. Like Valley said, it's only a cup. Then it's off to the great city of Cloggy Bum and minstrels will be singing songs about us before nightfall. Watching Whetstone pick his way through the darkness back to the Great Hall, Lightfinger turned to the older boy. You should go after him. Keep an eye on our dear little orphan. We can't afford any mistakes now, not when we're so close. Valley spat into the long grass at his feet. Lightfinger grabbed him by the arm and peered into the boy's face. Only a few days more, 
12 years of planning just for this moment. Soon I'll have all the power I ever dreamed of. The boy gets us the cup, the cup gets us the riddle, and when we've got the riddle, we won't need the boy anymore. Lightfinger released Valley and smiled. Something like that. The Vikings of Crud were still feasting. Whetstone followed the sound of crashing, smashing and out-of-tune singing towards the Great Hall. Viking feasts were legendary and very, very messy. They would be eating big lumps of meat, carousing, which is like singing, but involves trying to drown the person next to you with your drink, throwing axes and, if they were very unlucky, there might even be poetry. Whetstone pushed open the door to the Great Hall. The smell of sweaty men and women poured out. It was like being slapped in the face with a piece of warm ham. Whetstone held his breath and sidled inside. Luckily, no one seemed to have noticed he'd disappeared. A group of large men, each the shape of an upside-down triangle. This was the proper shape for a Viking. Massive, wide shoulders, arms like tree trunks and legs like twigs with round heads the size of pumpkins, were clustered together, singing. In the centre of the group, stuffing a whole sheep's leg in his mouth, stood Awfulric, chief of crud. Whetstone wiped his suddenly sweaty hands on his tunic and scooped up some plates. Oh, the third day is Odin's day, god of wisdom, song and war, the Vikings warbled. On this day we drink and feast until our tums get sore. Whetstone pulled up his hood to muffle the singing and ducked to avoid a thrown goblet. They might be loud, they might be enthusiastic, but they were not in tune. Oh, the fourth day is Thor's day. Awful Rick and the Vikings sang on. God of storms and lightning, we think he's a really great guy who gives the giants a pounding. Whetstone winced at the dodgy rhymes and tried to focus on the cup, pretending to scrape something sticky off one of the plates with a blunt knife. He straightened up and leaned away from the table. Behind Awful Rick was the fireplace. Next to the fireplace was the shelf. On the shelf, reflecting, leaping flames was the golden cup Lightfinger wanted so badly. Its coloured jewels sparkled, making rainbows dance along the rough wooden timbers of the hall. Whetstone stared at it, hypnotised by the bright colours. A chicken bone smacked into his ear, making him drop the plate and knife. He sank to his knees and scuttled under the table after them. Oh, the fifth day is Frigg's day, goddess of family. She knows the fates of mortal men just like you and me. Awful Rick finished in a very squeaky solo, his walrus skin boots lifting on to tiptoe as he struggled to hit the high notes. Asgard, Asgard, home of gods and fun. Asgard, Asgard, until the frost giants come. As the Vikings chanted the chorus, Whetstone abandoned the dirty plate and knife to crawl closer to Orphoric and the cup. Valhalla, Valhalla, the place where heroes go. Valhalla, Valhalla, when they're slain by their foe. The song reached its table-thumping crescendo, a nearby bench crashed onto the floor, bringing a crowd of Vikings tumbling down in a sweaty, tangled heap. The noise made Whetstone jump, banging his head on the underside of a table. Stars danced in front of his eyes. The Vikings cheered and whooped. Rubbing his aching head, he climbed out from beneath the table. Now, while everyone's distracted, it has to be now. Hearing a whirring noise, Whetstone ducked. A flying axe embedded itself into the wall just above his head, showering him in plaster. Gulping, he fixed his eyes on the cup. There it was, glinting in the firelight just out of reach. His fingers itched at the thought of touching it. I can do this. There is no way I'm going back to the angry bogey, he told himself, edging towards the fireplace. A large cauldron, suspended by thin chains, hung above the fire. 
The smell made Whetstone's mouth water. An old lady with an alarming amount of ear hair stood stirring the pot. You look like you could use feeding up, lad, she croaked, pushing a bowl into his hands. The smell hit his nostrils like a hammer, making his stomach clench. It's got sheep eyeballs in it, she held out the ladle. A milky white eyeball floated to the surface. Good for you. Helps you see in the dark. She poured it, eyeball and all, into his bowl. The eyeball stared at him. Whetstone stared back at it and shuddered. <sighs> Someone knocked into Whetstone's shoulder. The stew slopped in his bowl, making the eyeball sink down under the filmy water. Whetstone turned to find a handsome youth with a highly polished helmet standing behind him. The youth sniggered and brushed his gleaming red hair out of his face. What do you think you're doing, weasel from the kitchens? He asked with a sneer. This section's for VIVs only. VIVs? Very important Vikings. What are you doing here then, Braggy? called a loud voice. The owner looked like he ate live puffins for breakfast. It was the man with a dark, bushy beard who had suggested the ultimate shin-kicking contest. Whetstone gulped. Braggy scowled. The bearded man laughed and clapped Braggy on the shoulder, making his helmet slip down over his eyes and come to rest on his large nose. Whetstone tried not to giggle. I'm keeping an eye on this cockroach, Oris Mitre. Braggy pushed his helmet back into place. Just because Awful Rick gave him a job, it doesn't mean that we should trust him. Braggy looked down his long nose at the scruffy boy. He's not from Crud. Maybe I should just throw him on the dung heap, just in case. Don't be a prat, Braggy. What happened to Viking hospitality? You never know who might be knocking on your door, or as might a scrutinised whetstone from under thick eyebrows. But why are you hanging about up there? He's certainly not eating, called the hag by the cauldron. And I shaved the trotters before I put them in. Whetstone felt more and more eyes turn to look at him. His face started to burn. I, I, w I was, he stumbled, I was only, with a clang, his bowl dropped to the floor through trembling fingers, the eyeball rolling between Braggy's feet and staring at him balefully. Orismiter rested his hand on the axe that hung from his belt. Yes. Whetstone trailed to a stop. Usually he didn't have any trouble finding the right words, but now he couldn't think of a single one. A prickle of sweat broke out between his shoulder blades. I was only c coming to tell you that, forgot, that you forgot the verse about Tyr in your song. You forgot the god of justice. The lie popped out just in time. Orismiter peered into Whetstone's face, who tried to smile winningly, but his dry lips got stuck to his teeth. Orismiter's face cleared. By Odin's eyebrows, he's right, he yelled. Oi, awful, Rick, we forgot about Tyr. He turned to them, his face red with the heat from the fire. He glowered at a wide-eyed whetstone, then slapped himself on the forehead, making his helmet ring. Great Thor's toenails, how could we forget about Tyr? He's my favourite. A large, meaty hand reached out and yanked Whetstone into the group of singing Vikings. Whetstone found himself surrounded by a collection of massive, hairy men. He thought he could smell bacon. Awful Rick clamped Whetstone under his armpit. All together now! The boy held his breath to avoid the wafts of Awful Rick's body odour. Oh, the second day is tears day! the Viking choir began, swaying in time to the song. Despite almost being dragged off his feet by the rocking Vikings, the boy felt a jolt of excitement. The cup sat directly behind him. Lord of rules and law. Trying to only move one arm, Whetstone reached out behind him. The wooden shelf containing the cup appeared under his fingers. He quickly ran his hand along the rough plank, he had his hand bitten clean off. Whetstone's arm twisted, his fingers stretching out desperately, hoping to find something that wasn't made of splinters. 
He gritted his teeth, his elbow feeling like it was going to pop. But then his fingertips brushed against something smooth and cool. Ah, the cup! Whetstone wiggled his fingers, nudging the cup into his palm. He closed his hand around it. With a faint metallic rasp, Whetstone pulled his arm back and the cup disappeared into his cloak pocket. Which must have made it sore. The Viking choir exploded into chorus once more and Whetstone tried to sing along, his heart hammering in his chest. Asgard, Asgard, home of gods and fun. Asgard, Asgard, until the frost giants come. Whetstone leaned away as awful Rick's bearskin waistcoat tickled him under the nose. He had done it. He had stolen the jewelled cup. Now he just had to get away with it.